<laughs> she cried in a raucous voice, bending this way and that in time to the devilish racket. Behold my work, foolish man. Behold my mastery. Fool that you are to try to take mine from me. Today I shall make this woman a scandal and disgrace, and tonight I shall require her life. <laughs> For a fleeting instant, de Grandine turned an appalled face to me, and I met his flying glance with one no less surprised, for the voice issuing from the girl's slender throat was not her own. No tone or inflection of it was reminiscent of Julia Loudon. Every shrilling syllable spoke of a different individual, a personality instinct with evil vivacity, as hers seemed instinct with sweetness and melancholy. Cordieu! De Grandine exclaimed between set teeth, springing toward the girl, then halting in horrified amazement, as though congealed to ice in his tracks. From every side of the room, like flickering beams of light, tiny bits of metal flew toward the girl's swaying body, and in an instant her arms, legs, throat, even her cheeks, were encrusted with glittering pins and needles buried point-deep in her creamy skin like the torture implements driven into the bodies of the pain-defying fakirs of India. Almost it seemed as though the girl had suddenly become a powerful electromagnet to which every particle of movable metal in the apartment had leaped. For an instant she stood swaying there, the cruel points embedded in her flesh, yet seemingly causing no pain. Then a wild, heart-rending shriek broke from her lips, and her eyes opened wide in sudden terror and consternation. Instantly it was apparent she had regained consciousness, realized her position, her almost complete nudity, and the biting, stinging points of the countless needles all at once. Quick throw bridge, my friend, de Grandin urged, leaping forward. Take her, my old one. Do not permit her to fall. Those pins, they will surely impale her if she drops. Even as I seized the fainting girl in my arms, the Frenchman was furiously gathering the pins from her flesh, cursing volubly in mingled French and English as he worked. Parbleu, he swore. It is the devil's work of a surety. By damn, I shall have words to say to this accursed Draco who sticks pins in young ladies and throws knives at Jules de Grandin. Following him, I bore the swooning girl up the stairs, placed her on her bed, and turned furiously in search of the nurse. What could the woman have been thinking of to let her patient leave her room in such a costume? Miss Stanton, I called angrily. Where are you? A muffled sound, halfway between a scream and an articulate cry, and a faint, ineffectual tap-tap on the door of the closet answered me. Snatching the door of the clothes press open, I found her lying on the floor, half-smothered by fallen dresses, her mouth gagged by a Turkish towel, wrists tied behind her, and ankles lashed together with knotted silk stockings. Oh, oh, oh she gasped, as I relieved her of her fetters and helped her half-fainting to her feet. It took me, Dr. Trowbridge. I was helpless as a baby in its hands. De Grandin looked up from his ministrations to Julia Loudon. What was the it which took you, mademoiselle? He inquired, folding back the shawl from the girl's injured limbs and deftly shoving her beneath the bedclothes. Was it mademoiselle Loudon? No, the nurse gasped, her hands still trembling with fright and nervousness. Oh, no, not Miss Loudon, sir. It was, I don't, I don't know what. Miss Loudon came upstairs a few moments ago and said you and Dr. Trowbridge were taking her motoring, and she must change her clothes. She began removing her house dress, but kept taking off her garments until she was... She was... She hesitated a moment, catching her breath in long, laboring gasps. Among you, yes, de Grandin cut in testily. We'd waste time, mademoiselle. She did remove her clothing until she was what? Completely nude? Yes, the nurse replied with a shudder. I was about to ask her if she needed to change all her clothes when she turned and looked at me, and her face was like the face of a devil, sir. Then something seemed to come down on me like a wet blanket. No, not like a wet blanket, either. It clung to me and bore me down and smothered me all at once. But it was transparent, sir. I could feel it, but I couldn't see it. It, it was like a, a, like a terrible big jellyfish, sir. It was cold and slimy and strong, strong as a hundred giants. I tried to call out, and it oozed into my mouth, choked me. <coughs> she shuddered at the recollection. 
and I must have fainted, for the next thing I knew everything was dark, and I heard Dr. Trowbridge calling me, so I tried to call out and kicked as hard as I could, and... Et voilà, here you are, the grandin interrupted. I marvel not you are nervous, mademoiselle. Cordieu, are we not also? Attend me, Trowbridge, my friend, he commanded. Do you remain with mademoiselle Stanton and the patient me? I shall go below and procure three drinks of brandy for us. Yes, mon bleu, four I shall obtain. For one, I shall drink myself immediately, right away, at once, before I return. Uh, meantime, watch well, Mademoiselle Julie, for I think she will require much watching before all is done. A moment later, the clatter of his heels sounded on the polished boards of the hall floor as he hastened below stairs in search of stimulant. It is damnable, damnable, my friends, the little Frenchman cried a few moments later, as he, Captain Loudon, and I conferred in the lower hall. This poltergeist, it has complete possession of poor Mademoiselle Julie, and it has manifested itself to Mademoiselle Stanton as well. Pardieu, if we but knew whence it comes and why, we might better be able to combat it, but all, all is mystery. It comes, it wreaks havoc, and it remains. Dieu, 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 dieu. He strode fiercely back and forth across the rug, twisting first one, then the other end of his diminutive mustache, until I thought he would surely drag the hairs from his lip. If only we could... He began again, striding across the hall, and bringing up before a bool cabinet which stood between two low windows. If only we could... Ah! What? Who is this? Monsieur le Capitaine, if you please. His slender, carefully manicured forefinger pointed to an exquisite little miniature which stood in a gold easel frame on the cabinet's top. Looking over his shoulder, I saw the picture of a young girl, black-haired, oval-faced, purple-eyed, her red lips showing against the pallor of her face, almost like a wound in healthy flesh. It was a subtle something of difference, more in expression than in feature, from the original. Nevertheless, I recognized the likeness of a well-executed portrait of Julia Loudon, though it had been made, I imagine, several years earlier. Why, uh, I exclaimed in astonishment at his question, why, it's Miss Loudon de Grandine. Ignoring my remark, he kept his fixed, unwinking stare upon the captain, repeating, This lady, monsieur... She is who? It's a picture of my niece, Julia's cousin. Captain Loudon returned shortly. Then, don't you think we could occupy our time better than with trifles like that? My daughter! Trifles, monsieur! De Grandine cut in. There are no trifles in a case such as this. All, all is of the importance. Tell me of this young lady, if you please. There is so remarkable resemblance, yet a look in the eyes which is not the look of your daughter. I would know much of her, if you please. She was my niece, Anna Vasilko, the captain replied. That picture was made in St. Petersburg, Petrograd, or Leningrad, as it is called now, before the World War. Ah! De Grandine stroked his mustache gently, as though making amends for the furious pulling to which he had subjected it a moment before. You did say a was, monsieur. May I take it, then, that she is no more? He cast a speculative glance at the portrait again, then continued. And her name, so different from yours, yet her appearance so like your daughter's. Will you not explain? Captain Loudon looked as though he would like to wring the inquisitive little Frenchman's neck, but complied with his request instead. My wife was a Romanian lady, he began, speaking with evident annoyance. I was stationed for duty at our legation in Bucharest in 1895, and there I met my wife, who was a Mademoiselle Siraki. I was married before returning to floating service, and my wife's twin sister, Zui, married Leonidas Vasilko, a young officer attached to the Russian embassy about the same time. Things were beginning to move a little even in those days. One or two near quarrels with European nations over the Monroe Doctrine had warned even the lunkheads in Washington that we'd best be getting some sort of navy in the water. And then there was no time for a protracted honeymoon after our marriage. Anna, my wife, stayed on at Bucharest for a time, then moved from one port to another along the European coast so as to be fairly near me when I could get in frequent furloughs. Finally, I was moved to the China station. 
and she went to live with her sister and brother-in-law at St. Petersburg. Our baby Julia and their little girl Anna were born on the same day and resembled each other even more than their mothers did. Following the Spanish War and my transfer to home service, my wife divided her time between America and Europe, spending almost as much time in Russia as she did in Washington. Julia and Anna were educated together in a French convent, and later went to the Smolny Institute in St. Petersburg. Anna joined up as a nurse in the Russian Red Cross at the outbreak of the World War and was in France when the revolution broke. That probably saved her life. Both her parents were shot by the Bolshevists as reactionaries, and she came to live with us after the armistice. Somehow she didn't take very well to American ways, and when Robert, Lieutenant Proudfit, came along and began paying court to Julia, Anna seemed to take it as a sort of personal affront. Seems she had some sort of fool idea that she and Julie were more than cousins, and ought to remain celibate to devote their lives to each other. To tell the truth, though, I rather fancy she was more than a little taken by Proudfit herself. And when he preferred Julia to her, well, it didn't please her any too much. Ah? The Grandine breathed, a trace of the heat-lightning flash which betokened excitement showing in his cool eyes. And the Mademoiselle Anna, she is... Uh, she... died. Poor child, Loudon responded. She did commit suicide? I didn't say that. Pardonnez-moi, Monsieur le Capitaine, the other shot back, but uh, you did not say otherwise, and uh, the pause before you mentioned her death. Surely that was something more than a tribute of momentary regret. <sighs> yes, you're right. The poor youngster committed suicide by drowning herself about six months ago. Six months, did you say? The little Frenchman's face was so near his host's that I feared the spike of his waxed moustache would scratch the captain's cheek. Six months ago she did drown herself in the ocean, and Mademoiselle Julie's engagement to Lieutenant Proudfit, it was announced when? It had just been announced, but look here, I say, see here. Captain Loudon began violent protest, but de Grandine was grinning mirthlessly at him. I look there, monsieur, he replied, and I see there, parbleu, I see far past. Six months, six months, everything. It dates from six months of yore. The death of Mademoiselle Lana, the engagement of Mademoiselle Julie, the tapping at her window, the beginning of these so strange signs and wonders, all are six months old. Grâce à Dieu, my friend, I begin to see the light at last. Come, Trowbridge, my friend, first for the information, then the action. Turning on his heel, he mounted the stairs three at a time, beckoning me violently as he did so. Mademoiselle! Mademoiselle Julie! he cried, bursting into the patient's room with hardly a perceptible pause between his knock and the nurse's summons to enter. You have not told me all, Mademoiselle. No, nor near all. This Mademoiselle Anna, who was she? And what relation was there between you and her? Of haste, speak quickly. It is important that I should know all. Why, Miss Loudon looked at him with startled eyes. She was my cousin. But yes, that much I know. What I desire to learn is if there was some close bond, some secret understanding between you. The girl regarded him fixedly a moment. Then, yes, there was. Both of us were in love with Lieutenant Proudfit, but he seemed to prefer me for some reason. When Anna saw he was proof against all her wiles, and she was an accomplished coquette, she became very morose and talked constantly of suicide. I tried to laugh her out of the idea, but she persisted. Finally I began to believe she was serious, and I told her, if you kill yourself, so will I. Then there'll be two of us, dead and nobody any the happier. Ah, the Grandine regarded her intently. And then she gave me one of those queer, long looks of hers, and said, Maybe I hold you to that promise, cousin. Jean Kopeck. Life is but a kopeck. Maybe we spend him, you and I. And that was all she said at the time. But two months later, just before Lieutenant Proudfit and I announced our engagement, she left me a note. Have gone to spend my kopeck. 
Remember your promise and do likewise. Next morning. Yes, the Grandine prompted. Next morning they took her from the bay. Drowned. Ah, he let the single syllable out slowly through his teeth with a sort of hissing finality. Ah, at last, mademoiselle, I do understand. You mean... Parbleu, I mean nothing less. Tonight, did she say? Mon bleu, tonight we shall see what we shall see. Stay you here, friend Trowbridge, he ordered. Me, I go to procure that which is necessary for our work this night. He was through the door like a shot, rushing down the stairs three steps at a stride, banging the front door behind him without a word of farewell or explanation to his astounded host. Darkness had fallen when he returned, a small black bag in his hand and an expression of unbridled excitement on his face. Any change in our patient, he demanded, as he entered the house, any further manifestations of that accursed poltergeist? No, I reported, everything has been singularly calm this afternoon. Ah, so? Then we shall have the harder fight tonight. The enemy, she does marshal his forces. He tiptoed to the sick room, entered quietly, and took a seat beside the bed, detailing his experiences in the city with lively interest. Once or twice it seemed to me the patient's attention wandered as he continued his recital, but his conversation never faltered. He had seen the beautiful flowers in Fifth Avenue. The furs in the shops were of the exquisiteness. Never was there such a parade of beauty, culture, and refinement as could be found in that so wonderful street. I listened open-mouthed with wonder. Time given to extraneous matters when he was engaged in a case was time wasted according to his ideas, I knew, yet here he sat and chattered like a gossiping magpie to a girl who plainly took small interest in his talk. Eight o'clock struck on the tall clock in the hall below. Still he related humorous incidents in his life, and described the chestnut trees and the whistling blackbirds at St. Cloud or the students' masked balls in the Latin Quarter. What ails the man? I muttered to myself. He rambles on like a wound-up phonograph. It must have been about a quarter of nine when the change began to show itself in our patient. From polite inattention, her attitude toward the Frenchman became something like open hostility. In another five minutes she seemed to have lost all remembrance of his presence and lay with her eyes turned toward the ceiling. Then, gradually but surely, there came into her already too thin face a pinched, drawn look, the sure sign of physical and nervous exhaustion. Ah, we do begin to commence, the Grandine exclaimed exultantly, reaching beneath his chair and opening the little black bag he had deposited there. From the satchel he produced an odd-looking contrivance, something like the toy rotary fans to be bought at novelty shops, the sort of fan which consists of three twisted blades, like reversed propeller wings, and which is made to whirl by the pressure of the thumb against a trigger fitted in the handle. But this fan, instead of having blades of colored metal, was supplied with brightly nickeled arms which shone in the lamplight like a trio of new mirrors. Observe, mademoiselle, behold, de Grandine cried sharply, signing to me to turn the electric bulbs on full strength at the same time. The girl's languid gaze lowered from the ceiling a moment and rested on the little Frenchman. Instantly he advanced the mirror fan to within six inches of her face and began spinning it violently with quick, sharp jerks at the rotating loop. Regardez, s'il vous plaît, he ordered, spinning the whirling mirrors faster and faster. The three bright pieces of metal seemed to merge into a single disc, but from their flying it seemed that countless tiny rays of light fell away, like water scattered from a swiftly turning paddle wheel. For an instant the girl regarded the bright whirling mirrors without interest, then her eyes seemed gradually to converge toward the bridge of her nose as they sought to follow the fan's rotations, and a fixed, rapt expression began to steal over her features. Sleep, sleep and rest, sleep, and hear no orders from those who wish you ill. Sleep, 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 de Grandine commanded in low, earnest tones. Slowly, peacefully, her lids lowered over her fascinated eyes. Her breast rose and fell convulsively once or twice. Then her gentle breathing told us she had obeyed his command and lay fast in quiet sleep. What? I began, but he waved me back impatiently. Another time, my friend, he promised with a quick gesture of warning. At the present, we must not talk. There is too much at stake. 
All through the night he sat beside the bed, raising the whirling mirrors and commanding sleep in tones of suppressed fury each time the girl stirred on her pillow, and each time his order was implicitly obeyed. The patient slept continuously till the first faint streaks of dawn began to show against the eastern sky. Nazin, he cried, springing from his chair, reopening his black bag and bringing forth, of all things, a hyssop of mistletoe bough. Around and around the room he dashed with a sort of skipping step, for all the world like a countrywoman fanning flies from the house in summertime. Anna Vasilko, Anna Vasilko, who has wandered beyond the bounds of the tomb, he ordered as he waved his little brush broom, I command that you return whence you came. To death you have said thou art my lord and my master, and to the grave thou art my lover and my betrothed. Your business in this world is done, Anna Vasilko. Get you to the world you chose for your dwelling place when you cast your body into the sea. Near the window, where the dimming electric light bulb's light mingled with the beams of the waning moon and the flushing rays of the coming morning, he repeated his command three times, waving his brush forward and outward toward the ocean, which surged and boomed on the beach a quarter mile away. Something seemed to brush by him, something invisible, but tangible enough to stir the white scrim curtains, trailing lazily in the still air, and for a moment I thought I caught the faint penumbra of a shadow cast against the ivory wall. A monstrous thing it was, large as a lion, yet like nothing I had ever seen or imagined, for it seemed to resemble both a bat and a fox, with long-pointed snout, claw-armed forepaws, and great spike-edged wings extending to each side from close behind the head. "'Get you gone, unfortunate one,' de Grandine cried, striking directly at the shadow with his sprigs of mistletoe. "'Poor soul who would collect the wager of a thoughtless promise, hie you back to your own place, and leave the ordering of other lives to God.' The terrible shadow rested against the pale wall for a fraction of a second. Then— like smoke borne away in a rising breeze. It was gone. Gone, de Grandine repeated softly, closing the window and shutting off the lights. Call the nurse, I pray you, friend Trowbridge. Her duties will be simpler hereafter. A little medicine, a little tonic, and much rest and food will see Mademoiselle Julie as well as ever. Together we tiptoed into the hall, roused the sleeping nurse, and turned the patient over to her care. And now the other time you spoke of last night has come, I suppose, I said, rather huffily, as we drove home. You were close-mouthed about it enough all the while it was happening. Will you explain now? Most certainly, he returned in high good humor, lighting a cigarette, breathing in a great lung full of smoke, then discharging the vapor with a sigh of gusty content. It was most simple, like everything else, when once I knew the answer. <laughs> to begin, when first Captain Loudon explained his daughter's case, it seemed like one of simple hysteria to me, and one which any capable physician could cure. Why, then, I ask me, does Monsieur le Capitaine seek the services of Jules de Grandine? I am not a great physician. I have no answer and at first I declined the case, as you know. But when we go to his house and behold Mademoiselle Julie all unconscious as she wandered about, I was of another mind. And when I hear the noises which accompanied her, I was of still a third mind. But when that evil one hurled a knife at my head, I said to me, Parbleu, it is the challenge. Shall Jules de Grandine fly from such a contest? Now, across the Rhine from France, uh, those Borsches have some words which are most expressive. Among them is poltergeist, which signifies a pelting ghost, a ghost which flings things around the house. But the more often, he is not a ghost at all. He is some evil entity which plagues a man, or more frequently a woman. Not for nothing, my friend, did the ancients refer to Satan as the prince of the powers of the air. There are very many evil things in the air which we can no more see than we can behold the germs of disease. Yes, he nodded solemn affirmation. But when Mademoiselle Julie 
tells me of the mark which came on her arm, and I recognize the Romanian word for demon, I think some more. And when she tells me of the bird or bat which fluttered at her window and yet was not there, I recognize many things in common with other cases I have observed. Foolish people, my friend, sometimes say, come in, when they think the wind has blown their door ajar. It is not well to do so. Who knows what invisible terror awaits without, needing only the spoken invitation, unthinkingly made to enter. For attend me, my friend, very rarely can the evil ones come in unless they are first invited. And very rarely can they be gotten out once they have been bidden to enter. So all these things fit together in my mind, and I say to me, Mon bleu, we have here a poltergeist and nothing else. Certainly. But why should a poltergeist attach his evil self to that sweet Mademoiselle Julie? True, she are very pretty, but there are other pretty women in the world of whom the poltergeist do not seek shelter. Then, when the demon tell us he hold her completely in his power and make her to dance almost nude in her father's house and sticks pins and needles in her, I hear something else. I hear him promise to take her life. Why? What have she done that she must die? Then I see the picture of Anna Vasilko, very like Mademoiselle Julie she was, but there was a subtle something in her face which makes me know she was not the same. And what story does Monsieur le Capitaine tell when I ask about her? Ah, now we begin to see the light. She was Romanian by birth and partly by ancestry. Very good. She had gone to school with her cousin, Mademoiselle Julie. Again, good. She had lived in the same house here. She had loved the same man. And she had committed suicide. Best of all. I need uh, now only a little reassuring as to the reason why. The result I already know. You know what Mademoiselle Julie told us. It all fitted in well with the theory I had formed. But there was work to be done that night. The demon which made Julie do all kinds of things she knew not of had promised to take her life. How to circumvent her? That were the question. I think. This young woman goes off into trances and does all manner of queer things without knowing of them, uh, I inform me. Would she not do much the same in a state of hypnosis? Assuredly. Very well, then. I procure me a set of whirling mirrors, not because there is any magic in them, but because they are the easiest thing to focus the subject's attention. Last night I used them. I hypnotized Mademoiselle Julie before the poltergeist has a chance to conquer her consciousness. Hypnotism, when all is said and done, is the rendering of a subject's objective mind passive, while the mind of the operator is substituted for that of the subject. The poltergeist, which was really the revenant of Anna, had substituted her mind for Julie's on former occasions. Now I get there first and place my mind in her brain. There is no room for the other, and Mademoiselle Julie cannot take suggestions or brain hints from the ghost and destroy herself. No. Jules de Grandin is already in possession of her brain house, and he says uh, no admission to all others who try to come in. Mademoiselle Julie slept peacefully through the night, as you did observe. But what was all that monkey business with the mistletoe? I demanded. Tiens, my friend, the monkey's business had nothing to do with that, he assured me. Do you perhaps remember what the mistletoe stands for at Noel? You mean a kiss? What else? It is the plant held sacred to lovers in this day, but in the elder times it was the holy bush of the druids. With it they cast many spells, and with it they cast out many evil workers. Not by mistake is it the lover's tree today for it is a powerful charm against evil, and will assuredly lay the unhappy ghost of one who dies because of unfortunate love. Voila! You do catch the connection? I never heard that before, I began, but he cut me short with a chuckle. Much you have never heard, Trowbridge, my friend, he accused, yet all of it is true, nonetheless. 
and that hideous shadow. He sobered instantly. Who can say? In life, Mademoiselle Anna was beautiful, but she went forth from the world uncalled and in an evil way, my friend. Who knows what evil shape she is doomed to wear in the next life? Ah, the less we think on that subject, the better for our sleep hereafter. Come, we are at your house once more. Let us drink one glass of brandy for luck's sake, then to sleep. Mon bleu, me, I feel as though I had been stranger to my bed since my fifth birthday.